Considering that manifestation of spiritual creativity, which we call visions, I want to reflect on two examples of ecstatic imagery brought into view by extreme embodied experiences, in this case significant durational health challenges. This presentation braids together two healing visions separated by five centuries of time. I draw comparisons between a visceral holy vision experienced and documented by Teresa de Avila in the medieval period and an ecstatic vision I experienced myself whilst working with an alternative healer during chemotherapy treatment for cancer in 2017. Dr. Teresa de Avila, 1515-1582, was a nun and religious reformer of the Roman Catholic Church. Teresa was also a scholar who, like me, undertook practice-based, embodied, performative, autoethnographic research. Illness was an ongoing feature of her life as was prayer and meditation. She documented much of her experience of ill health, creating a unique medical record from the period. Commenting at the close of the 20th century, Michael Camille suggests that in a medieval world with presences unseen as well as seen, images of things were far more powerful than they are today. I suggest that at times of serious illness, such as cancer or a Covid world, unseen presences may readily resurface. Teresa is part of a radical, mystical, spiritual tradition which vibrates with aesthetically literate women. I use aesthetic here, as Timothy Morton does, in its broadest sense of relating to perceived sensory experience rather than just beauty. The particularity of the experience of being a Christian nun in the medieval period, Camille proposes, fostered sophisticated visual skills in these women who sought to make their own bodies sites for the performance of Christ's passion. He argues that this imaginary world cannot be fixed in a specifically sacred or secular context, but moves evocatively between the two. Teresa used her visions to reveal unseen contradictions of the feminine and find a voice to speak the unspeakable as a religious reformer. Her dream visions overstep and reintegrate more conventional church binaries, tuning in to body-spirit objects in their deeply sensual relationship with deity. One vision, famously interpreted roughly a lifetime later, by male sculptor Vanini, is set out here in Teresa's own words, as translated by Suzanne Warmer. Beside me, on the left hand, appeared an angel in bodily form. In his hands I saw a great golden spear, and at the iron tip there appeared to be a point of fire. This he plunged into my heart several times so that it penetrated into my entrails. When he pulled it out, I felt that he took them with it 
and left me utterly consumed by the great love of God. Medieval art, not to mention the current pandemic, reminds us that the troubled human experience of the sick body is widespread and persistent. Camille writes that medieval people may have found comfort by entering into the voluptuous sufferings of the saints. While the naked sexual body was consigned to the margins, the naked sadistically tormented body, whether of Christ or the saints, was given centre stage. Yet feminist art history scholar Turvey Sauron argues that here is a woman's own perspective which draws on the convention of her era and yet somehow troubles this staging of torment. In her envisioning, Teresa is openly and undecidedly oscillating between the deeply sacred and the deeply erotic. Her pained body is flooded with kundalini, life force, ecstatic, divine. Teresa substitutes the loving heart as an aperture to be penetrated. The word comes from the Latin past participle of apertus, meaning at once to open or to uncover, and at the same time to close or to cover. By their very nature, apertures oscillate. A diagnosis of a condition such as cancer is a diagnosis of uncertainty and in its own way throws the patient into a state of oscillation too. In the etymological dictionary I can't help but notice the link between aperture and the word apocalypse, ap -ocalypse an uncovering, a revealing, a removal of the veil of concealment, an unveiling of that which could not have been known before now. The personal or communal apocalypse of significant ill health opens an aperture to visions of all kinds. Indeed, in the 14th century, apocalypse the word itself meant a vision. Let me take you to visit the mindscape of a walled garden a place where I have been many times, often guided and accompanied by a healer. Timothy Morton's notion of aperture is pertinent. So what is aperture? The feeling of beginning? asks Morton. Stories begin with flickers of uncertainty. Every detail seems weird floating in a bath of potential significance. When the healer takes me to visit the walled garden, the vision always begins some way off. Then I move towards a door in the garden wall, an aperture, the opening to the story. The style of door might change, but when I arrive it is always closed soon enough I'm invited to enter. As Morton puts it, an object, in this case the door to the walled garden, appears like a crack in the reel. I invite you to consider part of a vision which I experienced during the poison medicine oscillation of chemotherapy treatment in 2017. In my journal I wrote, in the very centre of the walled garden is a fountain, a well, a spring really. Standing in the spring, 
a small child splashes about in the water. The bronze statue of the fountain looks down on the child, bronze arms outstretched, bronze songbirds perching on bronze fingers. And the waters of the spring are pumping up through the bronze body, rising to the top of the poised head and pouring out, flushing out through every opening, every opening, washing down as laughter back to the source beneath. In this vision I am both the child and the bronze statue, the gushing paradox of skin turned to metal wet and porous like the intimate surfaces of the human body. My body is at once hollowed out and filled to overflowing. The boundaries between states, solid, liquid, mucosal, become blurred. My field notes, kept at the time, rather understate the laughter. I can tell you I was crying with laughter, vibrating, jouissance as flow, flushing through, outpouring through every opening of my body, psychically washing away the fear, the pain and the toxic overload of chemotherapy. I want to compare Teresa's spear vision with my own dream visit to this well. Here I'm aligned with Morton's thinking around the need to surrender to total uncertainty where the outcome cannot be predicted. Morton's notion of tuning might well be applied to the medicine of such healing visions. Yet when you tune, he writes, real things happen, you are affecting causality. Just as at quantum scales entangled objects behave as if they were telepathic, Morton invites us to consider that this entanglement is spreading through a vast ocean of objects, all communicating and receiving information from one another an ocean of interobjectivity. Each of these two visions contain vivid esoteric symbolism. This imagery exhibits considerable entanglement despite the huge temporal, religious and cultural gap between me and Saint Teresa. In each of these visions, the intimate interior of a woman's body becomes the site of spiritual rejuvenation. Despite the context of significant health jeopardy, both Teresa and I are flooded with life force. It may be that healing does not require a classic fight between heroic health and evil illness but rather a succumbing to the life force in all its paradox. In this healing journey, the healer guided me to the garden. You will have noticed, of course, that it is a place centred on a metonymic well, but that part of the imagery comes from my own subconscious, not from the healer. The vision object the performance is created in the space between us.
Canadian psycho-oncologist Alistair Cunningham found three attributes which enable people to face cancer. No, not fighting, that's not one of them. Rather, these are agency, authenticity and acceptance. Like Teresa, I faced ill health with an established practice of embodied meditation, which facilitated me to explore and express all three, agency, authenticity and acceptance. For many, patriarchal church orthodoxy leaves the intimately braided and potentially healing relationship between the sacred and the erotic, the spirit and the body, frayed at the edges. Both Teresa and I reclaim jouissance, whilst, four centuries on, I interpret my own vision within an esotericism which lies outside a personal religious framework. My own and Teresa's visions are both at once utterly abject and deeply sacred, an enveloping exterior intimating a fecund interior. In a flow state, we are removing or dissolving questions of the exterior interior binary. An experience of flow is fundamental to human embodiment in our moist tissue, fluid emissions, and in Csikszentmihalyi's sense of deeply immersive activity. Was this surrender to flow, this flowing inner life of dreams, visions and mindscapes, a form of medicine alongside the chemotherapy? I believe it was. Significant ill health nudges us to step through the aperture of the unknown into more dreamlike dimensions of the world. I suggest that carefully held, non-logical space, dream space, can provide powerful medicine in times of deep uncertainty. The very uncertainty itself when enabled to flow, reveals what might be needed as well as and alongside biomedical treatments. Oh, mm -hmm.